The topic of this session is digital infrastructures and activism. Um, I'm Jan Tobias. I'm going to moderate this as good as I can, but actually we want to have a lot of input from you guys. So that's why there's also a flip chart down there where we, if that's going to work out, try to take notes and try to make a list of things that we talk about and that are relevant. Um, so what, what this group here had in mind when we were planning this session was actually to um, come up with some form of guideline that, that can be used by activist organizations to actually assess what kind of infrastructures they are using and how the, the values that these infrastructures promote or the companies behind those corporate infrastructures promote, um, how that aligns with the privacy goals of activists of the organization, but also with the values of that particular activist group. And um, so I myself, I'm, I'm a security researcher at University of Löwe, close by, but I'm also active in Extinction Rebellion. And for example, in our context, we use Google infrastructure, we use Facebook, we use lots of cloud services. And at some point at the end of last year, couldn't resist bringing a printout, but it's actually too small. An article from The Guardian came out um, that says that Google is actually making large contributions to climate change deniers. And that's the moment where as someone who's involved in these organizations is wondering if we are using the right infrastructure. So basically we are relying heavily on promoting our events, on managing our, our data, our environment, on um, corporate owned services that first of all promote, invest heavily in ideas that are not what we want to achieve, but at the same time spy on our users, profile our users, profile activists, potentially use that data for targeted advertising and stuff like that. So I, I think it's quite possible that some of these infrastructure operators know much more about how our organization looks like, what we do, what we are planning, how we think, how we tick, than we know ourselves. And to some extent, I think that's a pretty scary thought and that's exactly the topic we want to discuss here. Um, so. Um, Andrea came up with one quote that she gave us to work on planning the session and that is um, the master's tool will never dismantle the master's house by Audre Lorde, an, an American feminist writer. And then when I read this, the next quote by Edward Snowden came to mind that says, don't stay safe, stay free. Um, and I think there is some form of conflict between these two ideas, the, the way you use infrastructures for your purposes and the way these align with your values and, and how, how the values of infrastructure operators align with the values of, of activism of your activist organization. And that's exactly the topic we want to discuss about. Um, I have three wonderful people here today. I should have four. One is Friedemann, um, who is not available because he's sick. But I still have Dr. Amber, and I will give them a chance to introduce themselves. Um, I have Dr. Amber, I have not so Dr. Glynn, and I have not so Dr. Michael here. Um, so, <laughs> sorry for being intimidating. Um, so, so please um, pick up the mic and share your own ideas on the story and your own background and, and introduce yourself a bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, awkwardly going first with my Dr. Amber introduction. Um, yeah, I have just finished my <laughs> In the celebration of that, I've just finished PhD research uh, looking at how, <laughs> I like the woo there, thanks, <laughs> um, looking at how um, two organizations, Amnesty International and Tactical Tech, use data-driven technologies um, such as uh, website analytics, social media metrics, and customer relationship management systems um, and databases. And I was specifically looking at, in both of these organizations, how the values align with their work. So this is the values of those tools and how they use those tools and where that ends up in the work of those organizations and, and where it aligns with what their objectives are. And um, in terms of those values around those tools, I was specifically looking at like data-driven tools. So there's two sets of values. The first set is that often there's an, a tendency towards quantification and scale and that as examples, if you look at the websites of um, civil society organizations like Avaz or change.org or 38 Degrees, on their homepage they display, we have 25 million members, we have 400,000 petitions, we have 250,000 mailing list members this week, or 
th they're really displaying on the front page quantification and scale to prove something about their organization. Um, and then the second aspect or the second set of values is around being able to control the outcomes of your work. Um, so something that maybe lots of people here would know of is like A-B testing. So being able to send two different mails and working out which one gets the most results. And it's really based on having a standardized process where you can test what outcomes are going to be and get a specific response that you want from an audience. So these two sets of values, and uh, this is also how analytics from websites are often used to manage the amount of responses and the types of responses you get from your audience on a website. Um, so I was interested, how do those two values work in these organizations? And um, the first set is so that it's where, where they are used. Uh, as we heard this morning in this morning's talk uh, from the Friday for Future and um, from Sergei, then they, there's something very important about using these tools to communicate to a mass group of people. So it isn't to make a decision, but it's to make it, you've made a decision already, and then you want to tell a lot of people where, where to meet, what your stance on a policy is. You want to get that information out there. But it's really a one-way communication. And the second place that these tools are used is actually in also communication, but communication to funders uh, or to other politicians. So that would be the place where I saw them say, oh, we needed 2% of the population to get a meeting with a politician. And that's where they would say, so look at how we got 200,000 views on this YouTube video. Or they would send to their funders, they'd say, oh, we never use our website analytics unless we're proving to our funders that we've been impactful. And then we'll say we got 1 million website visits this year. So there's a real use of these tools, specifically when trying to prove that they've been successful to an external authority. The tools aren't used, and those, um, those values of quantification and scale um, aren't used when at the top of, at top level decision making. So at that level of decision making, it was um, people trust their intuition, and people want to have really deep discussions with each other and face to face, because they didn't really believe that data was a genuine representation of anyone's opinion, and they didn't believe that the data would, could tell them anything more than what they already knew as experts in the topic. And I think that people working in civil society see that a lot, that our opinions of like the topic and where to go next is really based on like experiences we've had and talking to experts. And the second area it's not used is in evaluating how successful something's, um, in, the, in the internal evaluation of how successful a campaign has been. Um, it was these sorts of data-driven tools weren't used because they don't show, they weren't it wasn't believed that they could show long-term change, and it would believe that they would show short-term fixes which weren't useful for them to work out what they should actually do next with their tactics and campaigns. So all of that to say that that's um, what my research has been on recently is like uh, working out what values align, and it seems that these tools are really only useful for communicating at mass, but for anything that's really evaluating and making decisions on what the next steps are in a campaign, they didn't, the organizations didn't engage with these tools at all. And I think we have to talk about, as a community, but also, yeah, that when don't we use data? And why don't we use data at those top level decision making? And like as an equivalent um, recruitment, use like headhunters to recruit really at the top level, but they'll happily use algorithms at, at the bottom level. And I think there's a similarity here that at the top level of decision making, then people just want to trust their instincts or really like meet people and talk face to face. But then when it's just communicating at mass to a lot of people, then they're more happy to trust these tools. So what does that mean for when we should use these tools and when we shouldn't? Yes, yeah, so, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm um, from Extinction Rebellion. I'm um, coordinating the IT team of Extension Rebellion Belgium. And so I'd like to introduce myself by explaining where I come from and uh, what, which challenges we are currently facing. And, and that's so myself, I'm coming from the startup world and I still work uh, on this world on the first part of the week and then the second part of the week. So first part of the week I, s I talk with, I have customers in my databases and second part of the week, I have rebels in my databases. And that's so I have to really switch my mind. 
And I'm myself an entrepreneur, I'm a developer, a designer, a project manager. I can do a lot of things with, um, with I can use the tools actually. And I, I was doing that. I was just taking the tools on the cloud and then uh, doing something. And I, was, I wasn't really taking care of, um, of my customers' data because they don't, it was not about that. It was about uh, finding a solution to a problem. And then I joined Extinction Rebellion. It was my first, first time activist activity. And I learned, I, I was like, oh yes, we will take the tools and we will use Google and uh, it will be super easy. And then I, some people said, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not working this way here and we have to take care of privacy of uh, we have ethics and blah, blah, blah. And so I'm currently learning all of that myself. And I'm switching my mind to, and um, doing that at Extinction Rebellion is quite challenging because we want, everyone wants to do things quickly. We want to act and uh, we want to, to do it quickly because we also have the energy right now and uh, Six months later, it's quite different. If we just if we are slowed down by um, by different things, and one thing that is slowing us down is actually uh, just selecting the tools the for uh, for just discussing together which which firm we will use, which solution we will use to send emails because we don't want to to put the data on an external service. So actually, we don't want external services at all. What can we do? So we have to do this in-house and uh, host our, serv our own services. And, and it's quite, um, it's taking more time. And it's, for me, it's like going back 10 years ago from now. I was like, one year ago, I was like, oh, it's wonderful. No, I just have to click on the button and I have everything and it works out of the box. And um, this service is connected to this other one and this other one and it works. But when you care about the, um, the data of that, that you have, um, uh, you cannot do that. You, you have to, to do it really uh, differently. And, um, and so it's quite challenging. It's taking a lot of our energy and it's slowing us down. But uh, now the, the our main challenge is to think globally because now we start hearing, hearing Friday for futures will have the, the same problems. Youth for climate, they have the same problems. Transition towns, they have the same problems. They, they are all um, having issues with that at their own level. And um, so in a way, we should find a global solution uh, to fix that, not just fix that as Extinction Rebellion or fix that as another um, activist uh, group. We should all work together. And just to explain what is happening at Extinction Rebellion, currently we, um, a lot of countries are working with Action Network. Action Network is a tool where you can, um, that you can use to recruit uh, activists. And um, it has been created by the, the people behind the, the Obama um, campaign. And so it's US-based, it's centralized, it's uh, also you have to pay for it. And in their terms of service, they say that you cannot really do things against the law. And we break the law with Extinction Rebellion. So um, we have a lot of data at the Action Network, on Action Network database. And so we said, okay, we, we now have to create a tool for Extinction Rebellion because the idea is that we uh, we want to decentralize everything. And all these tools mean that you centralize your data somewhere. And so we started working on a, a decentralized way of doing that. And now we are the second step that's it, that because we think we are doing that for Extinction Rebellion. We are creating our own platform, but we should have something that works for all activist groups and all community groups or citizens that want to work together and to reclaim their uh, data. 
Um, yeah, I, I think that's all for my my uh, introduction. I would just give the the mic to Glenn. Thanks. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, my name's Glenn, and I'm a freelancer. I work in kind of digital communications with NGOs, charities, non-for-profit organisations uh, around the world. And over the last ten or twelve years, I've probably worked with about. 60 or 70 different organizations and I just want to share some experiences and some of the some of the uh, a, a few interesting stories maybe around how some organizations have, have used data and, and some of the tools that they've, they've used and I spend quite a lot of time using tools like Action Network but also working with some organizations that have some very specific you know infrastructure they've developed themselves um, in-house and inevitably some of what I'm about to say is kind of there's some very generalizations, but it's just some, some interesting things in common um, that I've noticed, for example, with smaller organizations um, tend to be a bit further advanced with using tools like Signal, Telegram, and thinking about encryption when they communicate with each other. But at the same time as that, they often seem to be very, very heavily dependent on using Google infrastructure, for example, and using Gmail at the same time, or, or Google Docs and things like that. So there seems to be an inherent contradiction there in some ways around um, the use of tools, for example, with a lot of, a lot of smaller um, activist organizations. Um, and then another trend that I've noticed is with more medium-sized organizations um, starting to develop, ha having their own infrastructure in-house um, quite a lot of the time. And so running their own servers, maybe maybe even having developed certain apps and, and tools that they're using specifically uh, for themselves. But what I definitely noticed, for example, last year, two organizations uh, similar to that kind of thing suffered significant ransomware attacks because although they'd, they'd had sufficient um, capacity and knowledge to develop uh, that infrastructure for themselves, it wasn't necessarily being maintained and looked after to the level that's necessary in order to keep everything as secure as possible. And obviously that had a significant impact on the operations of, of those organizations. And obviously there's a you know, significant risk of, of supporter and activist data having been, been compromised as part of that. So I think that's a, there's a really in interesting kind of, the, the risks involved in developing infrastructure um, yourselves obviously as well. Um, and then, then moving on to sort of the very large organizations. So one organization I worked with around two years ago, in order for me to be able to start using their systems, I had to fill out a 14-page security questionnaire, going through incredible levels of detail and providing evidence that I had a, an encrypted hard drive on my laptop and things. And once I finally got through that process, uh, someone sent me an email with the password to their customer relations management in an insecure email with the personal details of over 600,000 people. So, and I think that's a really interesting example there of where maybe the organization's focus is moved in the wrong direction, where it's having all the policies and the processes in place. But then the, the larger you get as an organization, the more training and support is needed then for staff um, and campaigners and activists to actually be able to follow through with all of those processes themselves. Um, and I get the last thing I just want to finish on was um, it's a really interesting contrast of two organizations that um, I'm not going to name, but um, they both work in a very similar area, a uh, similar kind of topic. Uh, they're both international organizations. And one of them, they tend to do more policy focused work and lobbying and trying to get the law changed. And when they do public campaigning and work with activists, it's very much, you know, things like uh, uh, signing, getting people to sign petitions or maybe go and meet their, meet their politician, local politicians and uh, representatives. Um, uh, but it's all with the purpose of supporting that kind of lobbying work. And that organization has a lot of really strong policies in place around organizations they, they, they're not prepared to work with in terms of value. So they won't ever work with with Google and use Google Docs. They won't ever do any Facebook advertising or, or and things like that. And um, in contrast to that, another organization that works in a similar space, uh, they do lots of direct action, break the law, 
their entire infrastructure is based on Google. Their websites are hosted on Google infrastructure. They entirely use Gmail. Uh, they only ever use Google Docs. So I think it's a re really interesting contrast there that that second organization is one where potentially the security of activists and campaigners that they're working with is being compromised, but yet they're happy to put you know all of their um, energy into, into, sort of into sort of working with Google. So I think there's a really, really interesting contrast there. And um, yeah, I think really interested to hear people's thoughts on, on this topic generally. Thanks a lot for the intro. Um, so, so an interesting takeaway, and I would want to have your participation, so please raise your hands if you have questions. Uh, this should be interactive, and uh, I just want to make one point first. Um, that is, so, so what Amber, what you said is basically that you can probably to a large extent use these data-driven tools um, even in top-level decision-making to maybe even democratize institutions, right? Because you don't rely on to executives intuition anymore, but you rely on actual data and maybe make decisions that work for more people than what those two or three top level individuals would do. Um, at the same time, however, that seems to come with substantial risks and substantial disagreement throughout the institution. Um, did you consider that in your research? Yeah, um, yeah and I think um, it was really from the perspective, like the research was inspired from the perspective of um, NGOs saying that that's what they were doing, that they were going down a method of data-driven decision-making where they would gather their large digital membership database would be the way that they went through making decisions. And it was just very notable, at least in the two organizations I looked at, but then talking to people, it seems bigger that ultimately nobody does trust that data. So th there is a lot of rhetoric about how that seems to be the way it's going and data-driven decision-making is becoming a more, or data-led decision-making is becoming such a common phrase to each other about what they should be doing and what they'd like to look like they were doing, which I actually think is why they say, they use these numbers when they're communicating to other people. Like they want to say, oh, we have two million members and we have this many people on our mailing list because they want to show that they use like these digital infrastructures to have a lot of people involved, but ultimately when they make the decisions, they they wait for like the either a hundred key members to at an annual general meeting, or even just five staff members that they really trust, and that's when the key decisions are made. Okay, so the the interesting point was trust. We didn't talk about trust mm -hmm. before. I think we should elaborate later on trust, but I think I want some input from the from the audience first. There was there were some arms being raised. Do we have someone on the mic? No. I think you have to get up and be loud. We don't have someone with a mobile mic to around today. Ah, oh, it's there. Cool. Yeah. Hello? One, two, three? Yeah. Hi. Yeah, so... Uh, so, my name is Omri, I'm from a non-profit organization called Alliance for Europe. Um, we deal with uh, disinformation and hate speech online and civic tech solutions for civil society. Uh, also working uh, recently with Tactical Tech and, and others. And we've really had this uh, visceral internal debate. You know, s we started out using our own server with Outlook and so on. And now we're moving towards, you know, a Google Suite just because we use Google Docs all the time, uh, because you know we work with partners who use them, it's prevalent everywhere, and then you end up using people's personal accounts, which is less secure, da, da, da. there's always confusion about who's using what account. And so yeah, you end up with the Google Suite, which is not where we wanna be. But on the other hand, it's everywhere. So how can we really organize, you know, and what is this, I mean, this is kind of an open question, but what do you do? Like, how do we escape this? What can we do together to escape this? And can we have some kind of agreement that, okay, everyone uses this, you know, because there's, you know, uh, pharma docs and, uh, and discourse and this and that, and so many tools out there uh, that how can we scale up alternatives is my open-ended question to the room, maybe. It's an interesting question because there are actually many lists of privacy-friendly tools for organizing yourself, organizing your work out there, but apparently those don't make it to activist organizations or for whatever technical reasons people still stick, uh, stick with Google Docs. Yeah, uh, yes, I, uh, I wanted to add to that. I, I, I'm, I'm uh, 
doing research uh, in data protection, and I also noticed that many data protection researchers who also profess, and I believe them, that they care a lot about data protection and privacy, also have the same uh, problem in, uh, in using mostly Microsoft and Google uh, services. Um, and I think the one thing is that the security versus privacy, which is a very big, but it's also ease of use. Um, which similarly there seems to be an inverse payoff between protection of privacy and ease of use. Um, and in particular, uh, I would li like to ask my personal experience is that indeed the documents, uh, like uh, document sharing and documents simultaneously working on the same document in Google Docs, that seems to be the major uh, thing for which there is no real alternative to the same level of ease of use. Uh, yes, and I wonder if how people, if that's indeed a, a general thing, and that if there is a collective solution to that, indeed, in maybe uh, as the previous speaker said, like if if most people would collectively go to another platform, would that help? Okay, is there another comment we could take into this round? Yeah. Oh wait, now we have you. Okay, wait. Thank you. Um, I'm working with several feminist organizations or queer organizations, small ones, and it's always the question like, what tools do we use? And that's true that like, the things that are super used, um, easy to use, <coughs> they are fucked up. And so then you have to teach the people how to use like other kind of tools or like to discover the world of Prama, Prama services and this kind of thing. but. Those are not like the in interface, the interface, yeah, okay, so that. <laughs> the interface is not as easy, and so then people don't come to workshop or to use the tools for us to communicate, and it became a big mess. So if you have like uh, tips about that, it would be great. Thanks. First, I would like to, I disagree a bit with the ease of use thing. I think it's a question of habit. I think we are used to one thing, and then this becomes the thing that we find convenient because we only know, only know this one. So I think, um, and the question I have is, as activists, uh, do you think that you have a responsibility to, um, it's like, I hear this this in this uh, this speech all the time that uh, it's hard to change because people don't want to change and they are used to using some tools, but isn't the goal that everyone stop using those mainstream tools? Isn't the goal to uh, promote this and say, well, we are the first one to start using it and we force ourselves to make an effort to use it so that everyone is uh, in to insensitize people to use them and to make it more uh, easy for people to then change for themselves also. Okay, I think I want Michael's comment on this first and then we go this way. Um, an, an interesting point to connect your questions with what Lynn said is probably that in many of our organizations we actually do use privacy friendly, secure, um, distributed tools that are not owned by a particular platform, but we use them kind of sporadically, <coughs> right? So often you have maybe a group that uses Signal amongst themselves or that uses encrypted email or whatever, but at the same time, all what we communicate there, we stuff it in a Google Doc. And I'm really wondering how, how people, whether people actually think about these things that um, by, by using maybe Proton Mail or Signal, you have your nice secure communication and in the end you stick everything together in a Google Doc to communicate it to the wider audience. Or you copy things out of your Proton Mail threads into Google Translate because someone is speaking French and the other one is speaking Dutch. Thereby basically breaking all security guarantees you could possibly get from the cool decentralized and, and private infrastructure. So I, I think there are interesting discussion points here. Yes, uh, I, I share all the questions actually. Um, the, because when we, at, ex at Extension Rebellion, we started with the, we, we, are, we were just looking at how they did in the UK. And in the UK, when they started Extension Rebellion, they were doing everything on Google Docs. Uh, everyone was connected with their own name. And um, it was like they didn't care at all about 
all these topics. I think they they just they were just doing something, and they wanted to to make a rebellion. And um, I think now they are looking at this and they are taking steps uh, to focus to fix these issues. But we were looking at this from Belgium, where the situation is maybe it's a bit different. And um, when we started the, the local groups here, we were asking everyone uh, to select, to have a nickname. It was quite, quite okay when you ask your friends to have a nickname. They are, they'll just think for one minute and they say, okay, I found a, a nickname. Because they are new to activism because we wanted to have everyone into Extinction Rebellion, all, all our friends. And then we were saying, Oh, uh, there is just a second thing you have to do. You have to create another email address for encrypted discussions. Okay, uh, uh, maybe I will do it another time. And um, Or they were creating an email address, yes, uh, a proto mail. They were discovering this, like I did uh, one year ago. And um, they, they were participating for a few weeks. And then we were saying, we will not use Google Docs, we will use uh, Collabora or Nextcloud or things that they, they don't know about. And it was too much, maybe. We, we were asking them too much uh, to, to switch to tools that they, 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 they were not using and to understand also that, uh, because that's the question of what do we want to do? We want people to, to go away from Google or Facebook, but actually they first have to understand that, and understand what the issue is with that. And uh, um, so first, when we tell them you have to use ProtonMail, they will think, why? Why should I, why can't you send me an email on my Gmail address? Um, so we have to explain and uh, we have to understand ourselves. Maybe me, as an IT person, I will understand, but the coordinator of the group is not as, uh, I mean, th they don't even understand them themselves, maybe. They just want to act against climate change. And so we are always pushing people away from these tools, but actually they always come back to, to this. With like JT was saying, they will copy paste something to Google Translate or copy paste something to to a Google Doc or send a password by email to another to a, to a, a not mail address and and it's and everything has to be started again. So um, it takes a lot of energy. That's what I was saying to to do that. But I feel like we are teaching people we, as. As a, a new activism movement, we are on, a w on our way to teach people, to onboard people into activism, maybe, and to understand what it means from a data privacy point of view or so. And it will take maybe years, I don't know, um, before people understand exactly what, what it is about. Uh, but Yes, globally, I think I, I, um, I don't have an answer to the questions you, you asked because uh, we are also trying to go away from Google Docs and all these things, but as it's easy to use and it's, uh, it's, it's always like uh, at Extinction Rebellion Belgium, we, we said we will go to Nextcloud. We have our own cloud, on self-hosted cloud and we installed a uh, Collabora that you can install on your own uh, server and then you can have um, collaborative documents. It works like Google Docs. And then there was a bug. It wasn't working exactly as expected, so people were annoyed by that. And, um, and it wasn't fixed directly by the open source community. So we had to wait for the bug to be resolved or we had to fix it, yeah, of course. But then people said, okay, but uh, we, we, okay, let's go back to Google Docs. Oh, no, 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 so, so it's always very difficult. And then we, we said, okay, doing that takes too much time. We don't have the resources to work on that. Let's find another solution. And uh, we are still looking at the solution, actually. 
And we can easily connect that to the problem of values of activism again. For example, in Extinction Rebellion, we, we have this idea of actively mitigating for power and breaking down hierarchies. Now with, doesn't work? Whatever. So, and, and with the thing that um, Michael just described, we often have the problem that a circle of people is using a set of secured tools while the wider public is using a completely different set of tools and communication between those groups is slowed down. And that's not what we want. We want people to be involved in those cases. We, we, I think many activist organizations stand for a democratic revolution and this is often hindered by these disparities between tool use and by the tools themselves. Okay, uh, well, I also don't have any answers, but I do, I do agree with uh, someone who was saying about habit being a key part of this. I do think there's something in that that's definitely part of this, but also I do think there is a, a real issue around the number, getting people using something new sometimes and potentially duplicating. So if someone has Gmail, for example, they feel like they've got to use Proton Mail now, they're sort of duplicating and getting people moving towards those things. It does take a lot of time. One thing I always find incredibly infuriating is when I'm, if I'm working with an organization and, and they want to talk on Slack, or, and there's another organization that want to use Basecamp, and there's another organization that wants to use Asana or Trello, and I end up having to have accounts for every single one of these things. It drives me crazy. Um, <laughs> and so I really sympathize with people who are like, why do I have to use a different email account for this? I, it, is a, it is an issue. So I definitely agree with someone who is saying the need to scale this and really, you know, tools that are, you know, privacy, security focused, but also relatively easy to use. I think it would be amazing if 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 if, we're, if this was able to be scaled. Having said that, I also think there is a need for pragmatism here because if people's energy is being moved away from the campaigns and what they're working on, and is instead they're spending their energy worrying about the tools that they're using and having to learn something new that might delay campaign wins by months years and and that is an important consideration i think and i don't think and i think it's important to weigh that up and i'm not saying i completely agree that you know we've got to move in the right direction but the whole of society needs to move in the right direction to using the right tools not just activist groups and if that means in the short term sometimes we have to use some tools that the rest of society is still using in order to get there with society or bring society with us there's a need to think pragmatically about this, I guess. Yeah, um, I'm just gonna go in direct contradiction to what you just said. <laughs> um, but, uh, cause I, I think I, it really makes sense. It's really frustrating when you have to have lots of different logins and lots of different software. And I think that that also can lead to security and privacy breaches because you, you end up having to t keep track of more than perhaps it's possible to keep track of. Um, on the other side, I, I think that it's important to consider that anything that gets scaled becomes something that's going to become riskier and riskier. And that's from all any, any different adversary. Um, that's from the side of something like malware. It's also from the side of infiltration. Um, as soon as something's been scaled, it, it becomes a target um, and also potentially an easier target because people become more anonymized the more people that are using it. Um, so I think that just as a small push also for accepting the use of perhaps several different tools or tools that change every few years or I think that this is maybe something also that we have to learn to adapt to or that we have to work out how to make that work for us because maybe change and, and smaller tools is one of the ways of um, forward. Uh, I also just in a related manner, it, I also thought that on the topic of scale because it's not just that the public are using different tools to the groups, the private groups. It's also that, um, and also shown when I was doing the research, was that when it was a small group of beneficiaries of the work or a small group of experts working together, basically when it was small groups, people were really happy to use these tools. And as soon as it became sort of large numbers that people couldn't keep track of, like 10,000s to hundreds of thousands, at that point, that was when I saw security become really lax. And that's when I also saw that people became much happier quantifying their audience rather than referring to them as a group and not really caring, does, oh, it's 100,000, some of them are bots, we don't really know. Like, that's the point that they became, they started to not care. Um, yeah, and I, I think actually related to that, and just actually to come back to the point that um, 
about trust. Uh, I think that there's something really important, whatever the solution is, that trust is thought about because um, in the Catalonia protests, there was a lot of organizing through Facebook. Um, then they decided that wasn't safe, so then they moved to Telegram and WhatsApp. And then even that was being infiltrated, so then they started making all their decisions in face-to-face -face meetings in a room, so they would know who was there. And there's a real issue around trust, and in even when there's encryption um, involved, that you don't know who the emails come from, and also around these large-scale numbers, there wasn't this trust. So one of the things that, uh, one of the quotes I liked the most in my research was, oh, we get a million website visits, most of them, we think that a lot of that's bots, but obviously we're still going to use that for funders. And there was this real sense that that number was useful for doing something, and they didn't really care what that number meant as long as it got what they needed. But they would never use that for decision-making internally because they didn't trust that number. They don't trust that those are people. So I just want to be like cautious around scale and the need to scale and work out also how we work at a, a smaller level. Thanks a lot. I think there were some more arms raised. Um, yeah, I'll come to you. W one thing I would, so we started this this podium discussion, this, this, this panel, with the idea of talking about values as well. So what I'm really wondering is um, where you see the conflict between um, values of the platforms that you use in your work, in your activism, in your, in your things that you don't want to be too public, and yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so what would be a value that you personally or your organization tries to uphold and how does that conflict with the values of the platform you use? I think that's an interesting question I would want you to think about and get into the next um, 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 round of questions and answers. I think, I think, I think that's um, Indeed, a very good question. Uh, my name is Dawa, by the way. I, I work on value-based decisions using data uh, for municipalities and, uh, and groups in, uh, in Amsterdam. Um, and I think that uh, before you can answer your question, like how do values oppose each other in the values of an organization and the tools that you use, comes often the, the, the problem with the lack of imagination in, uh, in a group of uh, people to know why values matter when it comes to technology. And I see often in workshops that I need to give is that first we need to get a discussion why technology is not neutral, uh, to get that out of the way. Um, and this is already quite complicated for a lot of people. Um, then we have to have a discussion, so what are the core values of an organization that we are actually need to uphold? And then the third step is now how do we apply those values to the technologies that we use? Um, and in that sense, uh, we, we kind of getting somewhere when it comes to other values. Uh, maybe when I go to an Extinction Rebellion, I don't expect a, a lunch to be served with meat in it. You know, it's quite obvious that those choices are made. Maybe we can question ourselves why there are plastic throwaway cups at a conference like this. You know, you try to adapt where you can. Uh, but when it comes to technology, uh, as we have seen so far in the discussion, uh, very quickly it comes only like it's so easy to use. Uh, everybody knows it, and, uh, and we already have a login for it, so please continue with that. So, although it's good to think about the values and how they contradict with the technology, it's also like what space do you allow your group or some people in your group to really think that through? You know, what, how do they conflict each other? And quite often you could see that maybe Google Docs is at this moment not uh, uh, in conflict with our values, we can use it. Um, and we have to change it at a later stage. And the thing with values, and I think that maybe comes to the core, is you can never optimize your values 100%. There will always be some trade-offs. And maybe before you can say we use a tool or not, you have to think about the trade-offs. We can use it for this cause, but we are aware of the trade-offs and how can we mitigate it. So we can use Google Docs, but we're gonna encrypt and mitigate a little bit in this way. Um, we're gonna use Signal for small groups, and then we don't reach so many offers, and that's the, uh, so many people, but that's the offset that we know. So I think it would be also really good not only to think, uh, is it a zero-sum game? Yes, we can use it totally, or we can use it not at all. Is that, can we use it for a sub-goal, or can we use it and mitigate a little bit of the negativities that it causes for our group? I hope that's clear. Please speak, guys, you get warmer from speaking. 
I, um, I campaign in England with uh, children's digital rights and data privacy. And one of the problems we had was in the last six months in our general election, we wanted to run a campaign and reach um, people quickly and, and at scale. We took the decision as an organization not to have a Facebook page um, for a long time. But during the election, we wanted to be able to compete with the same types of political ads that were going out on Facebook. We found, we tried three times to get an account set up and each time they were shut down. And we weren't posting any content that should have triggered that. So when we try and use a digital infrastructure that is also not accessible to us, we're finding that limits our message. That's a risk model that we're finding hard to work with. It's like, how do we get messaging out where the platforms of the technology of the infrastructure available is actually inaccessible. And this is in a, a country that it should not be problematic. Obviously, there's countries where that is done by design. And the second question I have is um, around interoperability. One of the biggest problems we've got using Google Docs is that you know we use it because other people can. And how do we divide something that is design something that is going to be accessible by others that are not perhaps part of our network? We're not trying to look at um, an infrastructure that is within our activity group, but is actually going to reach out what other possibilities are out there. And, ag and the third thing would be where we might be able to use those resources better within our communities to find mm -hmm. what is out there. Because a lot of the time we'd like to use these things, but we don't know what is there. And it's very hard to search for things on the internet. Note I didn't use the G word. Um, we, we, we find it hard to look for things on the internet if we don't know what we're looking for. And actually it's hard, where do we go for a, con a shared platform of resources, of tools, of what is on offer if we don't know what we're searching for? So an idea for the community would be how do we build that so that we can all tap into those resources? I think that's enough for one round of answers. Eh? Okay, I just want to maybe make one brief thought on that, which is just more to agree with what you were saying there about the, and it's the issue of control there, and it's almost like access to democracy being controlled by private corporations. And I think that's what I mean when I was saying earlier about that sort of need to shift society as a whole to not find this acceptable. Um, I don't have any other answers to that at this point, but I think that's a real urgent need, and I think, you know, sorry to say scale again, but one thing that does need to scale is the membership participation and engagement by civil society as a whole with organizations that are fighting for this kind of thing. Um, and I know that conflicts with uh, maybe some of what you were saying about the sort of, you know, mass scale of, of organizations, but we need, we need more people involved in those kinds of organizations to, to get that changing, I think. Yeah, so <coughs> uh, that's again very interesting questions and thoughts. And um, on, on my side, uh, I'm thinking w uh, one thing, one thing that some people think in the movement is that um, in a way, when so it all starts with the registration form because that's what you want actually you, you as a movement you want people to act, but then first thing you want them to do is go to the registration form and fill the form. And then you can ask yourself about what will I do with all this data and all which tools will I ask them to use and all these things. And some people think that in a way we should uh, ask questions on the registration form to say, uh, we want you to understand um that your if you act with your own name and with your gmail or hotmail email address um this kind of thing could happen to you uh because this data is uh, shared with uh with the all the spy services and all these things so in a way w when people reach the registration form we should inform them about what can happen if they um, if they join us with something that we don't really want them to do? Or we can explain we should explain them. Or if you care about that, 
you could have a nickname and you could um, have uh, you could use a proton mail or another tool to to protect your own identity and then once people register we do whatever we want with with this data um, I mean that's what peop some people think uh, we should do that so that will be easier to put the, the data privacy issues on the, the person itself to say I know what I'm doing I'm doing it with my own name or not and with my gmail address or not and then uh, I and then do everything you want do do I just want to act and uh, so it would be easier on our, on our side to to manage that uh, so I'm I'm just thinking about that um, uh, about th th this specific uh, question about uh, uh, educating people about privacy of their about what are the issues uh, with the, the the fact that they use Gmail or also and Google Docs and then um, and then they can they can join uh, uh, any movement with that. Um, and I was thinking about something else, but I will come back to this later. <laughs> Um, yeah, I also am potentially just going to keep talking about the advantages of lots of different tools. Um, but the one of the reasons um, that, that I've thought about that a lot as well is because um, speaking to like how the UK has, has a changing environment of what sort of tools have become easy or difficult to use. Facebook um, and Twitter both changed their political advertising standards um, in the last year based on all of these conversations. And during that time, WhatsApp had already been very popular in political election campaigns in Brazil and India. And then the UK political parties began using that because they saw it so successful and because the rules hadn't yet shifted to monitor how WhatsApp's used. And I, I think that it's really important to remember that, firstly, people are always going to be changing their campaign tactics based on what regulations come in and what isn't regulated. And it's an area where new tools are developed all the time. So being ready to adapt to new tools and using lots of different tools is an important part of how it works. Um, but also that there isn't just um, a simple us and them. So it's not like we learn to use one tool and then the government learns to use another tool or shuts it down in some way. But um, that there's other groups that are in that space that are starting to use different things. When they develop, like if there's a group that's an adversary group in some way, that they'll begin to use a tool, that that tool becomes popular in some way. There's so many different groups going on, developing different spaces to talk to each other um, because of the wonderful ability to make anything on the internet. Um, so I think that it's really important to remember that these things will always be shifting and based on policy, based on all the different people's use. And I think like in terms of like the consistent like rejection of Google Suite here, I think it was really interesting listening to the talk on Russia for the people who went to that earlier, but that um, for them using Google, like using Gmail was better than using state-owned um, social media like VK because for them less pros prosecutions have been made and arrests have been made due to communications on that than there have been for their state-owned um, social media. And it really depends who your adversaries are and also what spaces are regulating those adversaries. Um, so I, uh, yeah, just a pro for that these things are constantly changing and it's about how do we learn to adapt to something that's constantly changing. Um, and I just wanted to also pick up on the values comment because I think it's really important that we talk about the values of technology over and above security risks and privacy risks. Um, I, I think that's why I was really interested in the concept of scale. I think the, um, and, and quantification that when we use these tools, uh, I think is a really good example, the yellow vests in France, they utilized Facebook's algorithms because they knew if they got more people and more likes that then they would be seen more. And they really, they talk, they've, there's some really great stuff they've talked about how they use that to their advantage. And then they were taken down by an adversary group or, or at least slandered by an adversary group because they were considered a populist movement because they were using tools which require scale um, to be successful, then they could be criticized for being populist. And I think that the, the values of how these tools work, it was, it was also technology-driven. Facebook just 
through Facebook's algorithms was how they knew they would get success. So they really worked to that and then they changed how they worked based on that and then they were criticized for changing how they worked based on that. So, so how we, it's not just that there's privacy and security risk, but there's also what do these tools tell us about how activism should work? So what I'm always wondering is this discussion that we're having here right now, um, it feels to me like it's a very isolated thing to organizers of activist organizations and to a bunch of privacy and security geeks that are sitting in this room here. So now let me try and connect our discussion back to the morning talk with the Fridays for Future people um, who are probably one of the biggest activist movements that we have in Europe right now or maybe even worldwide. W what do you guys think? How many people of your movement, and you've been talking about 20,000 in Nuremberg or something like that? How, how many of those are even aware of the discussion that we're having here right now? How many of them think actively about values of your movement, about values of tools, about their privacy, about the security of the infrastructure you're using? Is that an issue? Is that an issue as much as it is, for example, in XR? How many people in XR discuss these issues? I, I really don't know. So um, the best was if I would look something up. So um, I have the chats here from Fridays for Future Nuremberg. So just give me a sec. <laughs> um, it's, WhatsApp. it's WhatsApp and it's Telegram and I want to compare it. Um, So we have 51 people in the Fridays for Future Telegram group and about 1,000 on WhatsApp. So I don't think that privacy is such a big thing as well as we have uh, about 7,500 followers on Instagram. And I think um, these people are not very concerned about their privacy. And uh, we try to move these people actively to Telegram or because we think it's more secure and more private than WhatsApp, even though it's not uh, very good, but a little bit better. And uh, we still got so few users. Um, so I don't think that privacy is a, is a great thing in Fridays for Future. So Andrea just told me that we have two, three minutes. I give you 30 seconds to make your point. I just want to say it's a trap. If you start to think in these kind of things, it's a trap. You're talking about getting people on the street, hundreds of thousands. And if you want to say, but we can only do this if it's 100% security and privacy aware, and otherwise we don't, then you're, you're building a trap for yourself which you can't get out of. And it's the same with people uh, sailing across the sea to attend a climate conference in Chile, which is then replaced to, to Madrid. <laughs> you know, it's really nice that they take a sailing boat, but there will be you sometimes you need to fly to a climate conference. You know, otherwise you won't be there. If you if you all the time really going to be super strict on yourself, then, then this doesn't work. And that's why I say you need a value-based approach which is not zero sum. You always need to uh, balance it and be aware of it and then you can be as good as possible where you can be and be pragmatic also on the other side. Last chance for Lino and then I give you the chance to make a concluding remark and then we can go to the next. No, for me just a point. Uh, I think in this situation we need to think about transition. So we want, we have some tools like Google and stuff and we want to transition to different tools. So we need to, first of all, motivate people and explain why. And, uh, but also for me, we need to, the question that we need to ask is, how can we use Google to move out of Google? So how can we use this tool to move out of those tools? And uh, so I think there are ways to do it. For example, using Google to tell people they need to move out of Google and uh, having two parallel channels, two parallel um, tools, in, you know, and, um, it's a duplication of work at the beginning, but my work. Okay, for me, it's short-term pragmatism, medium-term, uh, a shift in society towards more security, privacy, values-driven tools, and long-term utopia. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna keep repeating myself on the same thing, that um, to have a global product that has 
that everyone will use that will stand the test of time, that will work for everyone's threat model, is something that I just don't think we should aspire to, and instead we should be just looking at how do we work better to adapt to different tools all the time that are and that shift both between groups and over time so that we can always be adapting. Yeah, on my side, I'm, I'm surprised that we, we actually think about all of that and uh, the police didn't come yet at my home and it would be easier for them to just take my computer and look at, even if the, the everything is encrypted, I think, why don't they do that? Uh, we, are, we are thinking a lot about leaving Google and um, all of these tools, um, but that's really challenging and um, I'm just wondering if that's like when if we want people to move, they will they have to see someone uh, who is who has really great problems with uh, the with the police or uh, any kind of service um, because of of data being uh, because because we know things about this person. Um, thanks to Google and all these things. And I, I don't see a lot of these cases, actually. Um, so I'm always wondering, should we really um, go away or not uh, from these tools? Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for everyone for participating. Thanks for the great panelists for sharing your insight. Thanks for Lou to write down what we've said. So we really want to develop like a guide thing. We'll certainly make those notes publicly available so that people can look it up later. And let's see if someone of you wants to contribute, then please get in touch. Thank you very much.